This morning on NBC5 In-Depth, history made on town meeting day. Representation matters. I did not see a leader like me when I was growing up in central Vermont. I did not see a woman. I did not see a mom who has young kids. I did not see a queer leader. Burlington voting in its first female and openly queer mayor-elect. We hear from Emma Mulvaney Stanick about her monumental victory. Plus, take a look at other town meeting day items that are impacting our communities. This is the time to, to show up and it's going to impact you. It's going to impact almost every facet of your life. And we talk about the importance of keeping this 200 year old tradition alive and why voting in your local elections really does matter. Plus, it's March, which means it's maple season. We don't know until it's over, so that's normally people say, if you want to know how the season go is going, ask me in May. We're tapping into the maple industry, asking insiders how the season is shaping up as we prepare for Maple Weekend. Good morning, I'm Liz Streppa, and this is NBC5 In-Depth. This week, Vermonters have made their voices heard at the polls voting in their town meeting day elections, and in some communities, they made history. Burlington voters choosing progressive Emma Mulvaney Stanick to be their mayor-elect, making her the first female and openly queer leader of the Queen City. It's also the first time a member of the Progressive Party is holding Burlington's highest office in more than a decade. The wife and mother of two thanking her campaign volunteers and supporters during her victory speech Tuesday night, saying she's ready to get to work while acknowledging that she is a role model for thousands of Vermonters who've never seen a mayor that looks like her. Representation matters. I did not see a leader like me when I was growing up in central Vermont. I did not see a woman. I did not see a mom who has young kids. I did not see a queer leader. And it took years. And that matters because we need to know, our young people need to know, our adults need to know, everyone needs to know that representation matters. Because decisions change when you have women at the table, when you have moms of small children at the table. When you have marginalized people at the table, decisions change because you remember that humanity matters. You remember that people matter. You remember that young people matter, that children matter. You have come to the table with a different orientation and a different perspective. Mulvaney Stanick's house seat in Montpelier will be vacated and Governor Phil Scott will appoint somebody else to take her seat. The mayor-elect will take the oath of office in Burlington on April 1st when the city holds its annual organization day. Now to some other local issues with broad impacts. Winooski had two major items on their ballot, a nearly $11 million budget for the city and a $4,600,000 bond to redesign the Winooski Bridge across the Winooski River between the Onion City and the Queen City of Burlington. Both articles passed, nearly tripled the amount of voters approving the fiscal year 2025 budget and the Winooski Bridge project also winning by a large margin of about 800 votes. We caught up with voters in the Onion City who are passionate about making their voices heard. No, you know, I understand why people don't like to vote, especially with national politics. I think it is really important at the local level because I think the local elections affect you a lot more than you realize. What makes Town Meeting Day so special is the fact that every town does their vote a little bit differently. Some vote by Australian ballot, while others really make it a big community event. Take East Montpelier, for example. Every year, the town hosts a potluck at the elementary school. People are asked to bring a dish that can feed up to eight people or pay five bucks for lunch. It's an opportunity for neighbors to get to know each other a little better, to have some good old conversation around the table, talking about the future of their town. Our potluck tradition, I believe, started years ago. A woman named Jean Kate um, was really active in the community and she started this tradition of having a potluck. And it's a great idea. Everybody brings their best recipe, so it's the most amazing lunch in town. Um, you put in an RSVP for it. Uh, either you bring in enough food to feed eight people, and it's just an entree. We'd, we're not asking for sides here. Go for the, go for the main entree. And, um, if you can't cook or won't cook and you get your RSVP in, five bucks buys you the best lunch in town. Looks good, and to make sure everybody can participate, there's even free childcare.
And speaking of really wholesome town meeting day celebrations, Bethel tried out some new tactics to bring people out to their town meeting day this year. Some ideas were a little more unconventional, while other things were geared towards building a stronger community. And BC5's John Hawks has this sweet story from the central Vermont town. It's time for town meeting. We got a lot of seating. The sounds of local democracy cheerleading. So that it wasn't about our mascot, the Wildcats, but more about town meeting and voting. Bethel leaders say that they are working hard to bring local democracy into the 21st century. We're just trying to keep um, keep it going. So we've got like today we've got a local artists playing music. We've got our social hour, which is out here. We have pie, coffee, tea, donuts. The whole goal is to try to encourage more engagement in local town matters. Organizers want people to mingle with their neighbors at the community fair, find out what's happening in town, and eat free pie and have a cup of coffee before going into the meeting. I think it's work to bring people back together and, you know, visiting. Where before you didn't go out and you didn't go visit your neighbor and <laughs> now you can. The town is also trying to make everything a little easier and more comfortable for residents and celebrate the fact that they can come together as neighbors. A lot of towns with COVID and stuff like that when we were doing COVID, it was all Australian ballot or it was outside voting. And we lost that community piece, that community connection with people. Um, and I think that's important. It's important to see the people in the community, for them to see each other and for them to actually voice their concerns about, you know, if it's a budget question or whatever else it may be, you know, that part of it. The small town is proving that bringing people together for town meeting day doesn't have to be all business. In Bethel, John Hawks, NBC5 News. To better understand the significance of Vermont's annual March Election Day, we wanted to check in with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and the Secretary of State's office, who are putting Tuesday's election in perspective. That's a piece of emergency preparedness. The tradition of Vermont's town meeting day dates back 200 years. Voters in the Green Mountain State coming together on the first Tuesday in March to weigh in on everything from their local budgets to local leaders and in some years, even presidential candidates. Yeah, I try to get out and uh, visit a town meeting or two every town meeting day as, you know, a member of the League of Cities and Towns. My job's to understand what these towns are going through, what the people are asking for, and how select boards and clerks are doing out there. And for Ted Brady, who leads the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, he views Town Meeting Day as one of the most important days of the year. The first big thing is this is really the first post-COVID town meeting that feels normal. Uh, I think last year it was a transition year still, and this year it does finally feel like, oh, this is what town meeting is. Uh, neighbors getting together, people uh, talking about issues that, they, that concern them, passing municipal budgets, uh, talking about social service agencies, talking about issues facing their community. The other enormous thing I'm seeing around Vermont is the giant sucking sound of education. And uh, this year, more than any year that I can remember, uh, municipalities are feeling squeezed. You know, most Vermonters, when they get their uh, tax bill, they may not realize this, but the municipal tax is a tiny percentage of that tax bill that they see in their uh, mailbox. Uh, most of it's going to the education fund. And this year, I think every municipality in Vermont is saying we have to cut, we, we have to limit our spending so that uh, the, the school funding, you know, so that we can pass the school budget also. And so the school budgets are having an enormous impact on municipal budgets this year. And this year, Vermonters making history while voting in the presidential primary, becoming the only state in the nation to pick Nikki Haley as their choice for the GOP presidential nomination. Vermont was the only state Haley won on Super Tuesday before dropping out of the race for the White House. This town meeting day being a presidential primary year, uh, this is your chance to have an impact on national politics and local politics at the same time. Uh, town meeting day is when you elect the people that are going to decide if your road gets paved, uh, if you have public safety, if you have fire, EMS, and police, you know, what kind of recreation programs your kids are going to have. Uh, these are all things that are dictated by those three or five or seven people that you elect to be your town, uh, your, your town selectmen, your town select people, also your city councilors. Uh, this is the time to, to show up and it's going to impact you. It's going to impact almost 
every facet of your life. To better understand how many people participated in this year's town meeting day election, NBC5 caught up with Vermont Secretary of State Sarah Copeland Hansis, who says overall turnout was low, especially for a presidential election year, with just 28 percent of Vermont voters casting their ballots. And uh, that, that is a little weak compared with the 40 and 41 percent voter turnout that we saw in the previous two primaries. Uh, but all of that, you know, needs to be put into context. In the previous two primaries, our own independent Senator Bernie Sanders was on the ballot um, on the Democratic side. And so that naturally drives a lot of turnout. And, you know, speaking of people being independent and crossing back and forth, you know, Senator Sanders routinely uh, finds people in the Republican camp who come and vote for him. And so I think the fluidity goes in both directions. The Secretary of State's office still has work to do. On Tuesday, the election results will be certified. So my mind really turns functionally to what we need to do now. So we have a week, um, roughly. Next Tuesday is the, um, is the official canvas of the presidential primary results. And between now and then, we'll be working with all the town clerks to really confirm that they have their, uh, their final results entered and that we have given them the stamp of approval. Um, and so that is what we're focused on really functionally. Um, I think it will be really interesting to see Vermonters now going back and engaging with their communities in those places where either the school budget vote was delayed because of uh, a, the school board thinking that the percentage increase was, uh, was too much for the voters to approve or some of those districts who, um, who were disapproved. So I think there's going to be a lot of focus on school budgets, on how we fund schools. I hear a lot of people talking about the fact that property taxes are not necessarily the fairest way, right? The value of your property, if you own property, um, isn't necessarily a direct indicator of your ability to pay. And uh, so maybe this is going to force some questions about how we fund education. I hope and expect that it will also force some of those questions about uh, whether there should be state aid for local construction. Um, we have aging school infrastructure in this state. Uh, we discontinued offering state aid uh, back during the Great Recession in the late aughts. And, um, and it's really important, I think, for us to think about whether we want to leave that burden on the local property taxpayers by not providing a state match for construction funding or whether there might be a fairer way for us to do that going forward. And these are really big conversations that will be taking place not only over the coming months but over the coming years. They're conversations that impact all of us and elections are our chance to weigh in. Town meeting day historically doesn't have as high a turnout as you know a presidential election, November election. Town meeting day is the most uh, uh, impactful uh, opportunity to determine what your community looks like, to determine how your community operates. It has long lasting impacts on every facet of your life. When you get in your car and drive down the street, when you send your kid to a rec program, when you call 911, the decisions made today will be the, uh, will be the outcomes that, that impact you for the next year and, and longer. They hope to see you out to vote in November's general election. Still to come here on NBC5 In Depth, it is the sweetest time of the year and people in our region are in the mood for maple. We caught up with a beloved creamy stand that celebrated its earliest opening day and we check in with the Vermont Maple Sugar Makers Association to get a pulse on the season so far and what all this warm weather means for Maple Open House weekend. Don't go away. Welcome back. Around here, March means Maple Month. It's a time when sugar makers open their doors for all of us to get an up close and personal look into their operations and, of course, to get a taste of that liquid gold. But the unseasonably warm weather has caused many producers to start boiling a lot earlier this year. We caught up, we caught up with Mark Yando, who owns Sugar Tree Maple Farm in Williston. They've run that farm for 30 years and are prepared for anything that might come their way when it comes to the weather. 
It's really hard to say that, you know, we, we can't predict what the rest of the season is going to be like, but, you know, we just need to be ready to, to give, to take what Mother Nature gives us and make as much maple syrup as we can before the season comes to an end. To be ready for it. The freeze and thaw cycles are so critical for the sap to run and producers really want nice mild days and cold nights for ideal sugaring conditions. But they don't want the weather to get too warm because that can bring the season to an abrupt halt. While some people have already been able to grab their hands on a maple creamy this year, a local favorite, Palmer's in Jericho, opened up th their doors for people to get their ice cream fix in February. It's the earliest that th they've ever opened. NBC5's Tyler Baronski caught up with some people who simply couldn't wait till summer for their favorite maple treat. A familiar sight at Palmer's Lane Maple in Jericho. With lines stretched far and wide. A small waffle cone with maple. To get their hands on Palmer's famous maple creamies. Yeah. These are the best creamies in Vermont. Alexis McDonald has been waiting for warmer weather so she could return to one of her favorite Vermont spots. Knowing the maple when they have the maple flavor, it's just made right here and it's true Vermont maple syrup. Owner Paul Palmer says he's excited to welcome creamy craving customers back. That's the first thing they say, oh, thank you for being open. Thank you for being open. Just because you know, the weather is so nice and they're looking for something and, you know, some nice treat. Typically, they open mid-March. He says the warmer winter has made production more difficult than usual. It could potentially be a short season this year. Palmer says warmer weather will force the sugaring season to end early. We really need those freeze-thaw cycles to, to get those trees to recharge with sap and, you know, keep producing. Palmer says the last few years, he's been heading to the woods months earlier than normal. Anson Tebbets, Vermont Secretary of Agriculture, says he's not alone. Many of our sugar makers were in the woods um, in December, January, tapping those trees uh, for days like this. Tebbit says sugar makers are committed to starting earlier because Vermont is one of the lead maple distributors in the country, producing 2 million gallons a year, covering nearly half the United States maple products. Our climate is different, but our quality, our sugar makers are really focused on quality. Palmer wants to continue setting the bar which will in turn put more smiles on people's faces. Without a doubt, Vermonters love their creamies. With all that said, we wanted to get a better idea about the state of the maple industry, and we thought who better to connect with than the Vermont Sugar Maper, the Vermont Maple Sugar Makers Association. It's the million dollar question. How will this year's maple season stack up against the rest? We don't know until it's over. So that's normally people say, if you want to know how the season go is going, ask me in May. Allison Hope is the executive director of the Vermont Sugar Makers Association. She keeps a close eye on Vermont's sweetest crop. For some, sugaring is a way of life. For others, a hobby. You have to be an optimist to be a sugar maker, to be a farmer, right? You have to be an optimist. And if you're not going to be an optimist about how things are going and you're not prepared to be innovative and roll up your sleeves, then it might not be the best um, best business for you. But there's no sugarcoating it. The tradition is extremely weather dependent, and producers are constantly adjusting based on what Mother Nature throws at them. This year, it's been high winds in December, followed by unseasonably warm winter weather, causing some early sap runs. But Hope says whether or not a producer is successful from year to year really depends on location. It depends on um, the slope of your sugar bush, what direction it faces, does it get a lot of wind, does it not get a lot of wind, is it north, is it south, is it in a, um, a valley, is it exposed, um, all of those things matter and so the best answer is it, it depends. Um, what I read is that the Northeast is warming up a little bit faster than the rest of the United States. And um, so it, it means it's even more important for sugar makers to understand best forestry practices, making sure that they um, care for a diverse sugar bush. With ever-changing weather patterns, Hope says we may start to see earlier maple seasons depending on the year. It has been shifting a little bit and so some of that is you know what I call maple algebra and some of that is the seasons and so people are starting to tap earlier. The smaller sugar makers um, with fewer taps um, can get away with tapping closer to the same time they used to. Um, so we used to hold maple school or maple conferences in January, and we've backed those up to December because in January, people have realistically been tapping. Mm. But if you are a larger sugar bush, 
um, you need to do the algebra of solving for when you need to start tapping. So how many people do you have to tap? How many trees do you have to tap? And how long is that going to take you? And so you have to, right, folks, kids, do your math. Mm -hmm. um, you have to back that up and figure out when you need to start tapping. And so larger sugar bushes will start tapping in December. And that's why we heard that those are the folks who are going to be best positioned to take advantage of the warmer weather. So we had some sap runs in December, and those folks were poised to take advantage of that because their sugar woods was already tapped out. Mm -hmm. um, and other folks aren't going to worry so much about it if they're smaller, and they'll tap when they, when they normally tap. But mm -hmm. boiling this year, you know, we have probably about a third of the folks who respond to the UVM extension surveys during the season about how things are going have said that they've had one of their earliest first boils ever. With the sap flowing, Hope and the dozens of sugar makers are boiling all to get ready for the beloved tradition of Maple Open House Weekend, which is coming up in just a couple of weeks. We have um, Maple Open House Weekend on March 23rd and 24th, and we have about 90 locations this year between some of our partner locations and over 80 sugar makers are opening their doors. And so, Oh, the storytelling you get along with the donuts and the maple cream and the syrup that comes fresh off the evaporator is amazing. And this is the time sugar makers pull out all the stops. And so they have volunteers come in to help them or other family members because not only do they want to make sure that they are taking advantage of this short window of time to bring in their crop, but they want to share their story. And they have such a great story to tell. They make some of the best maple in the world. Um, and they should be proud of it. And so it's just a really great time for them to share with visitors from all across the region. And in the spirit of Maple Month, Hope is encouraging you to try maple in a different way. We like to think about it as a pantry staple. And so I want people to know that it is, it is something that they should pull out no matter what they're making in their kitchens. And so I know that um, we got to that area of cooking when we were doing, you know, during COVID, people were home more, they were cooking more, it's a comfort food. So when you are making pizza dough or bread dough, pull out your maple syrup. Your yeast needs a little something to munch on as it's proofing. Why would you put processed sugar in there when you're cooking at home? Why wouldn't you put a little bit of maple syrup in there? If you're making curry, curry likes a little touch of sweetener. Maple syrup goes well in that. If you're making coffee, whether you're having coffee here in town or you're making coffee at home, maple syrup again. Um, I make a Thai peanut noodle sauce with maple syrup and that's also delicious. And of course, I put it on my waffles, but mm -hmm. um, it really can weave its way into everything and folks can feel good about supporting local producers um, from a forestry and agriculture perspective, but also they're supporting Vermont being forested. Mm -hmm. And the more that we talk about climate change and climate resiliency, the more we understand that it is really, really important to keep Vermont forested mm -hmm. and to keep those forests healthy. And so that help that helps sequester carbon um, within the trees and even the felled trees that are in the woods that, that folks leave down, those also are storing carbon. Mm -hmm. And so um, a healthy Vermont also means healthy sugar woods. And so supporting sugar makers and learning more about um, maple operations around folks, I think is really important. A tradition that gives us a deeper appreciation for our neck of the woods. If you'd like to learn more about Maple Open House Weekend or to find an open house near you, just head to the website that you see on your screen. It's vermontmaple.org slash M-O-H-W. We'll be right back.
Excitement is growing for the great eclipse on April 8th, and there's more to it than just a few minutes of darkness for northern New York and northern Vermont. Shortly before the moon totally covers the sun, look for a phenomenon called the diamond ring effect. An astrophysicist at St. Michael's College tells us the remaining bit of sunlight looks like a sparkling diamond with the rest of the surface of the sun forming that gold band of the ring. It's almost the last hurrah of the sun, uh, you know, stating, I am still here. So you're going to see almost literally something that looks like a diamond ring. And there's another phenomenon that happens seconds before totality called Bailey's Beads. It's when an uneven pattern of light peaks through the valleys at the surface of the moon, forming little beads of light. Our coverage of the Great Eclipse will continue for the next few weeks leading up to the big event. That's our show for this week. I'm Liz Streppa. Have a great rest of your day.